Craig, if I'm a new musician moving to town, what should I do? Move to Toledo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, welcome. We are welcoming you here. And, um, well, this happened in my career. Uh, it's a long story, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, and a lot of music and bands and getting discovered by Dick Clark, getting to Los Angeles in 1966, and which was an amazing time to arrive there. And uh, the birds, the Buffalo Springfield, all that, and uh, uh, became a regular on Dick Clark's TV show, Where the Action Is, and it was uh, mighty. So throughout uh, the 60s and early 70s, a lot of bands, a lot of playing, uh, a lot of touring, a lot, a lot of touring. And the band I was with, we had, you know, about 15 singles, never had a hit record. We were the kings of bubbling under. They had a chart under the top 100 and be like 113, 109, 100, oops, we're off the charts. And a lot of, a lot of stuff I could talk about, but just briefly, uh, Flo and Eddie and the Turtles in the mid-70s, a lot of touring, a lot of recording. Uh, late 70s, Nick Gilder, Hot Child in the City, all of that stuff. So while uh, back then, everybody I think just wanted to be a musician and maybe be part of a band that maybe had a hit record or you'd hear on the radio, we didn't really know that much about session men and growing up. Uh, we didn't know much about producers. Everybody just wanted to be in a successful band. All of a sudden, uh, maybe the early 60s, finally, musicians were given credit on albums, and you'd kind of go, oh, Hal Blaine. Oh, he played on that record, too. Oh, he did drums on that. And so that I'll reference why I'm saying that a little later, but now it's really different where people come to town. I want to be a studio musician. So things, I want to be a producer, things like that have changed. Back then we didn't know, we just wanted to be musicians. And uh, so recording, I'm so grateful. I started two track, three track, four track, and wow, all of a sudden we have eight tracks. So I got to see the whole growth of the recording industry. And with that came, with the various bands I was with, making records. So pretty soon I uh, started playing on more and more records. And the way it worked for a session guy was they, okay, you're the number one drummer and Will's the number two drummer. They would get you, oh, you're booked? Oh, oh, he's booked too? Well, I've heard about this new guy. So slowly your name starts to uh, get around and uh, I always say you do need a lucky break but it's up to you to be ready when that lucky break comes. Then it's yours to either succeed or to fail. So I always tell young musicians practice, do your homework, work, work really hard so then when that lucky break does come, you'll be ready for it. And uh, uh, so then just working on more things and then, well, you know, the next record would come along. They'd still try to get you, but maybe like, oh, you're still booked? Well, let's try that new guy. I got a shot again. One of the, one of the lucky breaks is they had... Uh, great session guy booked for an album, all of a sudden he calls and has the flu with 103 fever. A producer called me, Craig, I've never worked with you, but I hear you're a great rock and roll drummer, blah, blah, blah. How soon can you be at the studio? I said, maybe hour and a half, two hours. He said, if you get here in an hour, you'll get the whole album. That was that strange out of the blue break. I went in, started to work for him. I did a great job. He loved me. That led to this, this, and whatever. So I think you do need, you know, you do need a break, but then it's all about being ready. You just can't come into town, any town, unprepared. I mean, the, the uh, quality of musicians in this town is mind-boggling. 
So I guess uh, that would probably be one of the first things I'd say, you know, be prepared to do it. This is the major leagues. And, you know, I always, uh, I think the sports music analogy really makes sense. You know, X amount of kids are good enough to play grade school football and then high school football. But as it goes on, the number is less to play at a college level. And there's brilliant players in college who you know never ever see the light of day in the pros. And uh, it's similar in the music industry. And we're, you know, slugging it out in, in, with bands and playing in dive clubs and having the promoters burn you for money and no sleep and no how do we get to the next gig that's like the minor leagues that's like a you know a single a baseball team you know and then finally it progresses so uh there's a level of professionalism in this town and, and the uh, the quality in this town so i first feel like you're ready to come to this town <laughs> you know and if you are come on uh, so back to California and, and so more and more I started to play on more and more records and uh, pretty soon some pretty interesting phone calls, you know, Paul Stanley getting to play on the KISS solo records and, and uh, uh, started my relationship with Kim Carnes playing on More Love. That producer who had that drummer booked who had the, the flute, that led to that. And then Kim and I uh, wound up doing, I think, seven albums together. So it got so, by about 1980, 81, I could work in the music business without the traveling. When my wife and I were first married, I'd be on the road seven, eight, nine months out of the year. But now, uh, finally, that recording stuff was starting to happen. Let me just backtrack, because this could apply to somebody really young and like I said back then we didn't know what a session musician was we just were trying to be good musicians whatever that was and uh, so then you know in my mid early 20s mid 20s I go oh there's such a thing as session musicians the guys who make those records and Jeff Picaro was a rare story it happened uh, for Jeff at a very young level. He was rocking, you know, almost right out of high school. And by 21, 22, 23, I mean, he was just tearing it up. That's a rare story. And so I'm kind of 24, 25, 26. I'm doing some sessions, but I'm not that session guy yet. And I remember reading an article in a magazine. It was from an old bass player from New York and he said I don't know why for some reason I think session guys happen in their mid to late 30s well that gave me hope okay you know and now having gone through that cycle sure enough all of a sudden 30 31 32 the, the sessions are really starting to coming in by my mid-thirties, I was going non-stop out there. So I went, wow, that really w was true. And then I went, well, why was that true? <laughs> and I don't have the answer. I certainly don't know what that man was thinking about. But in my case, maybe it's that, of course, you gained more craft with your instrument you're more, more, more proficient and if you truly did your homework, if you really, really worked at it, you're going to be better. But then I think maybe it also comes with the fact of being a little older that you have more control over your ego and who you are as a person. And working in the studios or working live, working at anything actually is, is about relationships. And I, uh, I think maybe you're just more prepared to work with other people maybe in a way. I did a session uh, with Del Shannon 
and I'm a young kid and I'm I think I'm great and we're doing a session with Dell and he hits the talk back Craig that was a good take uh, that fill before the chorus was a little busy could you make that simpler and I'm still a kid and I'm going that was some of the coolest shit I ever played what's he talking about I still have that ego and I go well okay so I cut the fill in half and the end of the take Del said oh that was better but that fill is too, still too busy to make a long story short the fill into the chorus wound up being one, two, three. A flam on beat four. And that day I grew up. That day I went, wow, it's not about you. It's a, his session. He's the recording artist. He wrote the song. He's the producer. It's not about me. My job then is to give him the best that's ever been played. And, and so maybe that's what that guy had in mind about being in the 30s. Maybe you're just more secure in yourself and, and some of that unbridled ego or whatever it is, you know. So uh, it was a great journey. Throughout the 80s then, my career, I was probably, I don't know, top three to five guys out there working non-stop. It was two, three albums at a time, uh, just going on and on. It was phenomenal. A producer brought me uh, here to Nashville in 1983, uh, to, uh, Jimmy Bowen, to do a Hank Williams Jr. record. And they actually flew uh, Susie, my wife, in, and while we were in the studio, actually right across the alley, uh, Bowen's wife was showing Susie houses and they were really trying to get us to move here and uh, they said a lot of great things blah 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 there's nobody like you here come on we'll pay for the move and stuff like that and it was really flattering and we got back to LA after that and we said wow Nashville was kind of a cool place but in 83 we just weren't ready I guess you gotta check your heart with everything you do in life or should do and uh, we went yeah cool place but we weren't ready to make a move you know maybe we felt we hadn't accomplished I hadn't accomplished what I wanted to yet or whatever whatever reasons the kids I don't know but by 87 we were ready LA had changed so much I got there in 66 uh, Susie my wife uh, she passed away, by the way, five years ago. It was a great marriage, almost 34 years. Susie got there in 58. So we remembered L.A. when it was uh, still orange groves and farms in the valley. And it was, you know, just phenomenal. It was like the movies. But you could feel it start to change. Uh, my own little interpretation, too many people you know the races and cultures weren't getting along and and it just it just wasn't the same place and it was like wait a minute we're trying to raise three daughters here there's got to be a better environment for a family where I can still do music and uh, the choices really are uh, LA Nashville or New York and nobody's the big city nobody's gonna go into New York with a family and and all of that and try to make it so it was like okay let's give this Nashville a try our three girls were were scared we're going where you know they pictured hee-haw like maybe some of the people out there still do uh, but which it isn't true and uh, we picked up and moved you know and, and it was definitely a leap of faith we had it didn't have a house here uh, Besides, a handful of people really didn't know anybody, and uh, we just thought, well, let's give this a try. And uh, I guess maybe there was a little stress and tension, but my wife, she always had a way of, of just bringing things back to what really matters, and she just said, well, if we don't like it, we'll move back. So I guess that applies to people out there wondering about coming to Nashville. It's not do or die. If it, doesn't work out, move back. <laughs> right. 
sometimes people get a little too serious about that. And, um, and I went, oh, why I didn't think of that, I don't know. But I kind of took the pressure off. And uh, so here we came to Nashville. We arrived in December of uh, 1987. We stayed at Shoney's Music Row. And uh, that certainly scared our daughters. Back then there was still the Lefty, for, you could buy Lefty Frizzell shampoo and Elvis cologne. And it was like, Dad, Mom, where are we? All that's gone, by the way. It's really cool now. <laughs> and uh, uh, found a house and here we were. So then, okay, what do I do next? And, and I thought, well, I'm going to send out some resumes. So I got my resume up to date, put that together. All the albums I recorded by that time, I had written a couple of hit songs, won a Grammy as a songwriter. There was a, a very large amount of gold and platinum records and typed up the resume, all the album credits, discography. And I, I got a book, and I think they're still around, I just listed a lot of the Nashville producers and record companies and I knew certain producers worked for certain labels so I thought okay he works for so and so I'll send him one and I sent out 70 resumes just to let people know I'm here that was the only thing I had in mind uh, did I expect that people were going to instantaneously start to use me of course not every town the producers, the record producers, have their guys that they like to use. Just like when they would try to get you, and you were booked, and then you were booked, and I got my shot, and then pretty soon those people were going, I gotta have Kraft. I got, you know. So the producers have those guys that they've been using and that they like. But my hope was then just to get my name around. So once again, even though I was at that level in LA, once again, if the main Nashville guy couldn't make it, or even the number two, well, let's try this new guy. New guy, not as far as my career had gone, but certainly a new guy to this city. And you have to, I think, realize that. You're just not going to come in and turn the town on its ear. And uh, even with a track record like I had. And so... Uh, the first couple of years were tough. Thank God we had those years we did in Los Angeles. We lived off our savings. We got by. We loved it here. I mean, uh, we were a very low-key, relaxed family. Uh, very cool family. And I even noticed with us, after three or four months, everybody kind of went, Oh, this place just has a way of doing it, you know, with how neighborly it is and how welcoming it is you know and uh, uh, cost wise nowhere near what Los Angeles or New York or Atlanta would be it's uh, uh, friendly on that level things are cheaper uh, so we loved it here but still it was a struggle with work I went from going non-stop to nothing it was like wow and that's just was the reality for me you know, uh, other people uh, just made, it's timing. Certain people arrived either from L.A. or New York or wherever, and uh, all of a sudden, wow, we need somebody like that. So you, it, there's no time schedule. I'm just kind of talking about what happened for me. And uh, sure, all of a sudden, you know, a year, two years, a few people, there were some scattered things. It wasn't completely... Bleak. Uh, Kim Carnes actually did an album with Jimmy Bowen here, so at least I, I had an album to do pretty quick, and I was hoping then that could lead to either, you know, the recording engineer or some musician on that session learning about me. It's all about relationships. It's a, uh, it's not just about your ability, like I was saying. It's about your work ethic, your attitude. Are you happy? Do you really put out? Can they trust you? All of that stuff. It, 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 what kind of guy are you? So uh, uh, I had work. It wasn't totally bare, but nowhere near what it was like in L.A. And sure enough, oh, let me tell one quick thing. 
there was a neighborhood Christmas party a year after we were here and the neighbor said well Craig how's it going and I said well actually pretty slow he said you got to think about yourself as a business I, I thought that was curious he goes any new business moving into a new town from anywhere it's a three to a five year growth plan he said most businesses don't get really happening until they've been in a town for three to five years and I went wow even if that wasn't true it gave me hope <laughs> but I thought about that and I think he was right about that and I went wow I am a business I never thought of myself that way or even referred to myself that way and sure enough two to three years of being here the phone started to ring more and more and uh, it was kind of unique the, the some of the first batch of phone calls were Craig I really need you and I'd say to my wife why does he really need me this is and it was nine times out of ten and once again you gotta think back uh, with some historic perspective here to musically what was happening then things are a lot different now but back then uh, it was country was a lot safer and when they would call me they'd say we got these couple of tracks and they're just not rocking hard enough so uh, you know we'd, we'd like to try you on this and kind of when I came to town I had heard that people kind of branded me as a rock and roll drummer well yeah I played on a lot of rock and roll but they seem to ignore the television stuff the folk stuff you know there's more to life than anybody but I guess it's a natural tendency to categorize people so I would go do those couple of tracks and it's it was great to work but in some ways it was like that was just fostering the image of me that they had to begin with but it was cool. It wasn't like, let's get cramped to wimp this out, <laughs> you know. So it started to come. But uh, that, uh, and I'm still not done. That's a well, long one that answer to your question. Jump in any time. <laughs> Dave was talking about what a great mentor you are. I always ask, okay, you're new to town. How do you find that mentor to help you out when you come to Nashville? Yeah, and, and, I think it's just trying to network with people, just trying to meet people. Um, here at the Musicians Union, young people have come in and uh, certainly tried to give them advice and to help. And if there, if there is a musician, uh, it happened in the case of. This is funny. Uh, people think that since I'm a drummer I know a lot of drummers I probably know more bass players and bass players probably know more drummers there's only one bass player on a session one drummer so I, I, I would have it easier recommending a bass player for a while than a fellow drummer it took me a while to get to meet some younger guys in this town who I'd either see play live or Craig can I send you a CD or a tape yeah of course come on and uh, one of those guys did and I went wow this guy's good and then if I would get some phone calls and if I was booked or if it was a gig that I couldn't take maybe a road something or other was going on I recommended that guy and uh, it turned out that that guy usually wound up getting the gig so that made me feel good you know and then those people realized that maybe they could come to me for a recommendation and my name's kind of on the line so it better be somebody good so I guess uh, uh, I don't know if that fully answers your question it's just uh, it's got to fit right I think for both parties but you never know who might take you under your wing you know and I've seen a couple of young guys uh, you know play uh, and not just drums any musician all of a sudden I'll uh, you're a guy at a club somewhere and it's like holy shit that guy's good and you get who is that guy you know and you take note of it and something might not crop up for a while and all of a sudden somebody's trying to put something together 
that's kind of like what that kid was playing like on oh I heard this guy you know so you never know about that mentoring you know I think it just has to I guess that has to happen almost on a natural level too do you think so or not I don't know I don't know if that's fully the right answer to that well I've had a couple people come along as a songwriter yeah to sort of mentor me be a mentor and a friend but that came out of a friendship kind of thing. Yeah, like you were saying earlier, a relationship. It relationship. is about, right, that it's not, Maybe once again, it's n nothing I don't think is going to magically happen, you know, except maybe that one lucky break I was talking about. But yeah, it's just about meeting people. And then when we came to town, Susie and I, we would go out night clubbing a lot to get a feel for the town. Let's just see what what's going on in this town. And all of a sudden, uh, it was an amazing, uh, it was the first Christmas we were here, the Bluebird had kind of like their uh, annual Christmas show. And all of a sudden we're in town for about three or four days, but it was like, we need a break from unpacking. Let's go to see this. So we went to the Bluebird and my God, here is Ashley Cleveland. And then uh, uh, Pat McLaughlin, incredible guitar player. And Susie and I were in the audience, and we kind of looked at each other saying, it's going to be okay, <laughs> you know. So uh, it's going out, and after the show there, uh, I just wanted to tell those people how good they were and how they impressed me. And Susie was just like, you know, we're brand new to town, you know, but my God, you killed us, you know, and then... Oh, you look like a musician. It just can happen, you know, but I think it's a matter of getting out and meeting people and uh, seeing what's out there and you just never who you're going to run into or come across or whatever. So it, it is all about people.